Hi! I'm Sylvia from Vintage Kitchen Vixen, where I share tips for simple living, creating memorable gatherings, and preparing wholesome and traditional recipes with a vintage twist. And today, we are going to talk about a larder. Now, you may not even know what a larder is, so we're going to get into that first. A larder is a room or a cupboard that is meant for storing food. So it's kind of like a pantry, but historically it got its name from a room that was designed for storing food, uh, specifically meat that was covered in lard to preserve it, hence the name larder. Before the dawn of modern refrigeration, they were found in almost every home. Sometimes they could take the form of a root cellar or a cold room. You could find barrels of apples and potatoes and root vegetables and all the good things that were preserved from the summer harvest to feed the family through the long winter months ahead. Didn't work hard during the summer to build up that larder and you didn't have a store nearby, well, you were going to be in trouble that winter. Today we don't really have the need for such a room. Some houses are lucky enough to have root cellars and they're lucky to, enough to have cold rooms. I do not live in such a house. I do have a second fridge. It's just a small little fridge and sometimes I, I store my extra ferments in there. Growing up there was one house that we lived in. I had not one, but two root cellars and I think my mom had every intention to use them properly, but instead it stored our bicycles. <laughs> I'm sure she's kicking herself now for doing that, unless there was food in there and I had no idea. Uh, my mom has tendency to hide things, but she did have a room in the basement that was just full of her canned goods, but there was also potential to be able to store much more food, but we didn't live there that long. She had a huge garden, but we didn't live there long enough for her to really need those root cellars, I imagine. Anyhow, the problem with not having a larder or a well-stocked pantry today is that we've become dependent on grocery stores, and that's I guess that's something that we've really come to see this year is how much we really do depend on going to the grocery store every week to gather all of the ingredients needed for the week's menu. And because we rely on modern refrigeration, we have a tendency to store less food. I mean, there are households out there that don't even have enough food to feed the family for a week or two. And maybe, and I'm sure money does have something to do with it but I think just relying on the modern conveniences that we've come to depend on so much, we just haven't felt the need to store things up. And I think that also has to do with the amount of storage space that we do have in our homes. The third issue, if you are smart enough to store up food, is that it might not always be of the best quality. So for one, most canned goods well, those cans are lined with BPA, which is terrible for our health in more ways than one. Secondly, there are a lot of preservatives and salt in canned goods. Plus, you can't always ensure the quality of the produce that is used to fill these cans. Unless, of course, they are certified organic. A lot of fruits and vegetables are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides, and those also wreak havoc on our health. The more we can do to positively impact our health, the better off we will be. And so coming back to the tradition of filling up our larders and our pantries for the winter months ahead, it's only going to do us good in the long run. Right now, we are in the beginning of August. And I know in some areas in this world, like you're already knee deep in produce and you have more than you know what to do with. I'm at the cusp of the harvest season. I have green tomatoes on my vines. I just picked a whole bunch of jalapeno peppers to ferment them. And I'm going to talk more about fermenting soon. So hold your horses. But we are now in the season to fill our larders, to fill our pantries, our cold rooms, our root cellars, whatever you want to call it. We are in the season to prep for the winter so that we don't need to rely on going to the grocery store every single time. And I mean, in the beginning, there is more of an upfront cost because you're going to be buying or growing things in bulk. Um, for example, if you've never canned before, you're going to need to go out and get yourself a whole bunch of jars and that can be expensive at the beginning. But I mean, there are things like the barter system. You can find these things in thrift stores if you're lucky enough for yard sales or Kijiji. There might be somebody who's willing to do a trade. I, I saw one story on my Instagram where somebody traded 
a bunch of meat for a bunch of jars and I thought that was a wonderful trade and I think bartering is something that we should do more of instead of less of and a lot of us don't even know what bartering is or how to barter and myself included I am terrible at negotiating deals anyhow that aside yeah we are in that perfect time to get ready for the winter and there are a few different areas that you can source your food from so the first one that comes to mind is if you have a victory garden and if you are confused as to why i prefer to a regular vegetable garden as a victory garden i do have a video that's all about that 2020 has been a year where there has been a huge resurgence in gardening which is great to see not so great if you're one of those gardeners that wasn't able to get your hands on any of the seeds that you wanted or on steaks for your tomatoes or extra cages for your tomatoes or the things that you usually get throughout the season they were all sold out this year really hard to get your hands on something like chicken wire so you could protect your Brussels sprouts from the squirrels for example um, and yeah, there was, there was a huge resurgence this year, which is fantastic. So there's going to be a lot of harvest this year, and I think that's where this video also comes in handy, because what's the best way to preserve that harvest? I mean, some gardens are pretty small. Mine is pretty small. I don't have a lot of land to garden on, but I do make do with what I have. Like, my flower beds up front, I have four zucchini plants out there, and then, well, I mean, I could go on describing my garden, but I just, I recently gave a full tour of my victory garden so I will link that video in the show notes below in case you want to have a look-see. Getting your produce from the garden is the first source that comes to mind for when you are looking for produce to fill up your larder. The second area that you can source your food from are farmers markets. So these are everywhere in the summer months. If you're lucky sometimes there are permanent ones that are around every single day. Sometimes it's a weekend thing. I'm sure there are pop-up farmer markets as well. That's one way for you to find large amounts of produce to preserve for the winter months, whether that's a huge bushel of tomatoes or beans or zucchini or whatever it is you are looking for. Apples is another great one. Another way that you can get your hands on food is to go directly to the farm. Maybe if you want to preserve a bunch of apples, make applesauce and apple pie filling, go to an apple orchard and pick your apples or just get a ton of apples while you're there. Usually if you just do a quick Google search of farms in your areas that you can visit, you will have a selection that you can go to and then that way you can also determine like what kind of farm you go to. Do you want to go to a farm that specializes in organic produce? Do you want to go one that supports biodynamic farming practices? Do you want to just go to a family farm where they have activities that the family can enjoy? You're going to have your pick of farms in the area. If you're lucky enough to live in an area that has and agricultural presence. And if you do live in such an area, you might be lucky enough to have roadside produce stands that sells uh, extra produce that they have on hand. And usually when these are available, you can get your produce pretty cheap um, and it's fresh because it's usually picked the morning of or maybe even the day before, but a lot fresher than what you're gonna get in the grocery store. Finally, and this is more of like a fun idea, but it's having a produce swap party with a friend. So maybe you have one friend who buys a huge bushel of beans and you have the apples and you get together and then you can share. Or you know what, you can even have a canning party together and share the fruit of your labor. Once you have your hands on the produce that you need to preserve for those winter months ahead, you need to preserve them. So there are several different ways to get around this. The first one, and that's this is probably the most popular one that comes to mind, is canning. So canning can be a bit of a process. I really enjoy canning. My mom used to have like canning marathons where she'd just do a bunch of pears in syrup and peaches in syrup and she'd do dilly beans and jars of tomato sauce and stewed tomatoes. So she would just go all out. She'd have like two weeks where she would just can just about every day and of course I was in school so I had no idea the work that she was putting into this because not only was she going into the garden and washing the produce and getting it ready for canning but then there's the pickling, there's the processing that goes before you even sterilize the jars and if you've never canned before one of my blogger friends does have a blog post that's all about how to 
get started with canning so check that out if that's something that you want to get into this year. I like home canned products as opposed to store canned products because I'm storing my food in glass. Yes the lid does have a little bit of BPA lining to it but there's supposed to be some space between the food and the lid so usually the food is not touching it as opposed to a store-bought can everything is touching that lining. You also get to reuse your jars later and your lids so there's also that sustainability factor in there that you don't get with the store-bought canned goods. I suggest, and this goes for everything, I suggest starting out with the items that you buy a lot of. So if you buy a lot of tomato sauce, if you go through a lot of applesauce, if you like buying apple pie filling or salsas, chutneys, pickles, I would start there. Just the things that you use the most of and get those in your pantry. Canning is a lot easier if you're able to get together with a friend because if you are brand new to canning, there is a little bit of a startup cost involved because you're going to need to get a big pot and depending on the size of jars that you are using, you might have to have two pots because liter pots can't be used in the smaller pots. And even the pint, pint jars should be used in the bigger pots as opposed to the smaller. And I learned that this year, but then there are, um, there are different tools that you're going to need like a funnel, a special funnel to fill your jars so that you can keep things nice and neat. You'll need canning tongs. I don't know the names for everything, so don't mind me. And then there are all the jars and the lids. If you're making jams, you might want to have a thermometer to monitor the temperature. I mean, there are window, there are tests that you can do that don't require a thermometer, but I like, I like the precision that a thermometer offers. Um, so. That's one thing that just to keep in mind that the startup cost can be a little bit overwhelming, but you can find canning supplies in thrift stores and in yard sales. So just keep your eyes peeled for those. Just throughout this year, I've been buying a case of jars here, a case of jars there, so that it's not going to hurt as much when I do start canning up a storm. Okay, moving away from canning, there is dehydrating, freeze drying, or just plain drying your produce. So. I actually have a dehydrator here in my corner. I had to turn it off because it's pretty loud. It's a basic dehydrator. I will link it in the show notes below. But the thing I like about dehydrated foods is that they're really easy to put together. When I have more produce than I know what to do with, I usually just dehydrate it because they make great snacks. You can also dehydrate garlic and then crush it up, just pulverize it, and then you have your own homemade garlic powder. There are so many things that you can dehydrate. You can make fruit leather. They also retain their nutritional profiles. So that's great too. And it's still considered to be raw. So if you, you're one of those raw foodists, dehydrating is something that you probably already do or want to get into. Fermenting is one of my favorite ways to preserve food because not only is it rich in probiotics, which is really important for gut health, I mean we're basically made out of bacteria so it's important to maintain that bacteria and to make sure everything is balanced. So fermented foods are great for that. There's just been so much hand sanitizing lately and it just really <laughs> messes with our good bacteria which messes with our immune systems and our health. And Anyhow, fermented foods are good and we should eat more of them and we should make an effort to learn how to ferment if we've never fermented anything before. So I do have a couple of recipes that are available already. There is a tutorial on how to make sauerkraut from scratch and sauerkraut is basically the gateway ferment. If you've never had raw sauerkraut, it might take getting used to, but you can slowly add it to your food, slowly get used to it, using it as a condiment. It's nothing like the cooked sauerkraut that I grew up with. Even like, in fact, my mom, she made my sauerkraut recipe and she's like, oh, it was so good. I made it with ham and I'm like, you cooked for sauerkraut? Because when you cook it, it just, it, it kills a lot of the bacteria and a lot of the good things that you want to be consuming. Anyhow, um, I do have a tutorial on making sauerkraut. I also have a tutorial on making lemon chili carrot sticks that are fermented and they are so good. They are amazing snacks. Uh, instead of giving your kids raw carrot sticks, give them a fermented carrot stick. They're, give them a fermented carrot sticks. They're easier to chew. And the thing about fermenting is that it really enhances the vitamin profiles. So, you know, you, raw carrots are great but fermented raw carrots, 
even better. Like it's just going to take those carrots and whatever you're fermenting up to the next level. The thing with ferments is that they never really stop fermenting. You can slow them down considerably when you store them in the fridge. So, um, usually you ferment at room temperature. The higher the temperature, the quicker something is going to ferment. But when you put it in the fridge, when you put it in a cold room, it slows the fermentation process right down, but it's still fermenting. So if you have a jar of sauerkraut in the fridge, over time, that flavor profile is going to change because it's going to keep fermenting in the fridge. It's just going to take a lot longer. And that's why it does have, and well, I don't want to say an expiry date per se, but it usually keeps from anywhere from six months to two years, depending on what you're fermenting. So for example, I have a leek paste in my fridge that I made in June from wild ramps that I foraged. The paste that I made, I think it's has a shelf life of about six months, but I'm going to be using that in soups, especially when things start cooling down and we get into soup season, I'll be using that in just about everything. Um, it'll be a really delicious flavor boost. I do have a book to recommend if you really want to explore fermenting. So um, one that I have on my bookshelf and that I always and that I always refer to is Fermented Vegetables by Kirsten and Christopher Shockey. Another one to peruse is um, anything by Sandor Alex Katz. So he is the fermentation father. He's basically the person who helped revive the fermentation movement and just make it popular again. And well, I mean, it's not super popular, but it's slowly gaining in popularity. He has a few books out. Um, the first one I think was Wild Fermentation, and that really put his name on the map. And then he has another one that I really want to read, but I haven't. I kind of like skimmed through it. I really want to get it. I should get a copy. But it is called The Art of Fermentation, and it's more detailed. Uh, wild Fermentation, I know it has some recipes in there. Um, the Art of Fermentation really gets into the science behind fermenting, if I am correct. You can ferment just about everything. You don't even need anything. You just need jars. I like making small batches, like anything that'll fit into a quart or liter size jar. I'm still pretty early on in my fermentation journey, so I haven't invested in any big crocs, and I really want to get crocs, but they are expensive. And you have to be careful with the vintage ones, because I have seen vintage crocs in antique stores, and the problem with those is that some of them have, a lot of them have lead paint, so if, you, if there are scratches or anything, you might poison yourself. So I stay away from vintage earthenware, vintage crocs, for that reason alone. You can use gallon jars, you can use crocs, whatever you can get your hand on. Um, I actually have a small batch of fermented jalapenos going on right now, and that video is actually coming next week, so keep your eyes peeled for that. So this is about two cups of sliced jalapeno peppers, and I wanted to do a larger jar of it, but I ended up making a small jar. Uh, I have garlic in there. It's going to be really good. Such a good condiment for like tacos and anything that needs some spicing up. It's so good to include something fermented at, at your meal. Anyhow, this is not a video about fermentation. I could go on and on and on about fermentation. So I'm going to stop and move to the next method of how you can preserve your food and fill your larder. But when you do ferment, I'm not done. I have a hard time silencing myself when it comes to fermenting, but the downside is of fermenting is that you need space to keep your ferments. They need to be kept cold and you can't can them because if you can them, you're going to affect their nutritional profiles. So you're going to all this trouble to ferment your foods and boosting those nutritional um, profiles, but then when you put that can in a boiling pot of water for 10 minutes to seal your jar, I mean, all that good bacteria that you built up, I mean, it's, no, that, that's what canning is for. So if you get into fermenting, you need a cold room, you need a fridge, you need cold storage to be able to put them away. So that's where a root cellar comes in handy. Another way to preserve produce is to freeze it. Now the issue with freezing and refrigerating produce, like, I'm specifically referring to the fermented things, but the problem with preserving this way and relying on appliances is that the power goes out. So if the power goes out and you don't have a generator to keep everything running, there is potential for um, a lot of food waste and you need to use those things as soon as possible. So 
uh, that is one thing to bear in mind. So it's of all the different ways that you can preserve your food and build up your larder, your pantry, your winter pantry, um, freezing and refrigerating your foods isn't the most self-sufficient way to get around it, especially if the power goes out and you, you lose all of that hard work and all of that money. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. The one thing with freezing is that you need to you need to do a little bit of research before you preserve something because some foods are better off blanched before they are frozen. So beans, for example, they do well with a quick blanching before you put them in the freezer. So that's just boiling them in water for like one or two minutes before you freeze them. And it's the same thing with asparagus. It's a, the same thing with a lot of vegetables. So just give that a quick internet search before you freeze anything just to make sure that you are following the right protocol for freezing. The last method to consider, and this doesn't have to do with vegetable or fruit produce, but if you hunt, if you fish, or if you have access to these kinds of goods, one way to consider preserving that bounty is to either cure or smoke your meat. If you've never cured anything before, I do have a really simple recipe for a duck prosciutto, so it's kind of like a duck ham. It's really easy to make, it's delicious, and it kind of gives you an idea of how to cure meat, or at least dry cure meat, salt cure meat. It takes about a week to get it done. But on a larger scale, like I can't really help you there, but there are so many resources out there and YouTube videos and books that you can get that will teach you how to cure and smoke your meat. So it's just a matter of looking it up. And I think you can also play around with making pemmican if you really want to go old school. My mom, for example, she's a hunter, so she's really good at preserving her meat. So. Her meat, she usually freezes it. My mom doesn't bother with curing or smoking, but she does freeze her meat and she will also make big batches of stew, which she will can. And when you're canning meat, you need to make sure you use a pressure canner because meat is alkaline. It doesn't have enough acidity to preserve it properly. So if you try giving anything with meat in it a water bath, it's the same thing with beans. Beans are an alkaline food they don't have enough acidity to preserve it. So you might have issues with botulism. You want to make sure that you go around preserving those things the right way. So if you can your stews, make sure you pressure can everything. Um, another thing that she will do, she will render her fat. So if she gets a bear, she will render that fat down and have this beautiful jars of fat that she cooks with. And it's such a treat. Um, but for the most part, she freezes everything from her hunts I think it would be worthwhile for her to learn how to cure and how to smoke because unfortunately she does like her cold cuts and there are a lot of harmful ingredients in there. The downside of curing your meats is that you do need some heavy duty preservatives. So nitrates and nitrites, they are a bit carcinogenic. So that's one thing to bear in mind. The duck prosciutto that I mentioned earlier, it just uses regular salt but when you get into like heftier pieces and larger quantities, and I guess it also depends on the meat, it needs a salt that, it, that can cure it. But <laughs> I, um, I feel like I'm starting to lose my voice because I've been talking so much, and if you are still with me, thank you so much for tuning in and for listening to what I have to say about filling the larder and getting ready for those winter months. I think it's a beautiful thing to work on self-sufficiency and to come to rely more on yourself and your abilities to get creative and to store your own food and to grow it and there's so much victory in that I think. I think it's commendable when people try to develop these skills um, that have largely been lost so if, if we're kindred spirits in that manner like that's awesome. And thank you so much for being here and for tuning in for this episode of Vintage Kitchen Vixen. If this is your first time here, I really hope you will subscribe to the kitchen and follow along every week. I don't do these kind of videos as often as I used to. I've been experimenting with my styles. I'm moving away a little bit from my silent film mode videos. Doing the vintage inspired um, voiceovers is actually a lot easier for me. I'm able to say everything that I want to say during the video, so that's great. And I get to keep the recipe shorter for you because, at least for me, I am more likely to pick a recipe video that is 
five minutes long than one that is 20 minutes long because it's not the recipe itself, it's just me talking and not being able to stop talking about it and just sharing my stories. So if you like that story aspect to my videos, uh, to my older videos, let me know. Uh, because I do like talking, especially when I get the ball rolling sometimes. So if I seem a little bit rusty today, that's why it's just been a while since I got in front of a camera and talked, ex except when I did do the garden tour because I talked for like an hour. <laughs> oh gosh. and. I probably have an hour worth of footage. I've been talking for a while and I can't stop. Um, so yes, if you are new here, subscribe, hit that bell notification. I put out one new video every week. And if you did like this video, be sure to hit the thumbs up, leave a comment because that really helps me out and share this video on social media. And if you do any of those things, it really helps me out. It helps other people find me and I don't know if you know this, but social media platforms like YouTube, like Instagram, like Facebook, it's all algorithm driven. So it's pretty hard to crack that. In the meantime, I am so grateful that you are here and that you're tuning into me every week. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for every like, for every comment, and for every way that you show me support. So thank you so much. And I will be seeing you next week with fermented jalapenos. Bye for now. not only is it rich in probiotics, not only is it rich in probiotics. I keep hearing beeping. Okay.